theology. And uh, we're just excited for this vision collection of talks. I, I would just propose to you, we need bigger vision for what God wants to do in our lives. Uh, Alyssa and I were, uh, I was a pharmacist, she was a nurse, we did that for 10 years, we were lay pastors, and even as people that were in uh, these jobs and as people who did ministry kind of in the margins of our life, we would struggle with thinking small about our lives. Like, how many of you just thought, God, can you just help me get through another day? Anybody, you've been there? Okay, just me, the rest of you are good. Okay, I see one person. Uh, I would propose to you that God doesn't want you to just, like, get through your life. God wants to help you and me have bigger vision for what God would want to do through our family. Uh, I was reading this week about John Edwards, and he was uh, a former uh, president of Princeton University. Uh, but what's even more notable about John Edwards is the legacy uh, of his family. He passed down faith from generation to generation. And if you uh, Google John Edwards, you'll see that there were many great leaders that came out of his family tree, but they all really attribute it to the legacy of faith that came through their you know, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, John Edwards. And so my wife has a family like this. Uh, when um, Floyd Beckstrand was a young man in Tokyo, North Dakota. Some of you didn't even know that there was Tokyo, North Dakota. It's spelled differently. Um, you don't want to say, hey, I'm from Tokyo, and then have it be like North Dakota. It sounds much cooler if you're from Tokyo, Japan. But it's T-O-K-I-O. Raise your hand if you've been to Tokyo, North Dakota. All right, some <laughs> represent. Uh, but uh, my, my grandfather-in-law was radically saved as a young man. In fact, his testimony was so crazy in his own eyes, like how he encountered God, he was too embarrassed to tell other people about it till later in his life. He went to a prayer meeting at a small church in Tokyo, North Dakota, and he was, I'm not going to get into too many details, but he's a guy that if he came to Jesus, other people would notice. And he began to teach Sunday school at this small church. Word got around that Floyd Beckstrand was teaching Sunday school at a church, and people started getting really interested. Like, I've never thought Floyd Beckstrand would say the word church, much less be in a church, much less teach Sunday school in a church. Did you know that Floyd Beckstrand, uh, they, he and his wife would have five children. My father-in-law is one of those five. Um, in my wife's family, there are 14 credentialed ministers and missionaries doing work throughout the earth. My wife is one of the 14. Um, she's also related to almost everybody in North Dakota, so I always joke with her, you had to marry me. You were related to everyone else. <laughs> Which I'm okay with, by the way. You know, if, if you want to marry up, this is just for a young person here, or an older person, whatever. But if you want to marry up in life, you just have to be okay with some of these you know, minor details. And I've just thought so much about my wife's story, because I believe that Northview Church, we are a people who pass a legacy of faith to our kids, to our grandkids, and that we literally bless the whole earth because of your family tree. Do you believe that? And, and we got to think bigger, though, because a lot of us, we have very messy family stories. Uh, there's been a lot of pain in a lot of our families. But I'd propose to you that if we allow God, through the power of Jesus Christ, to fill every space of darkness, of shame, of regret, of sin, and all those things, God, and we see this in Abraham's life, will bless people through you regardless of your past, regardless of all your regret and all the things that you've done wrong. And that's why I'm so really excited to go into the Christmas series. We're going to talk about boy Jesus. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? So there's this great era of Jesus' life that like nobody talks about. And it's after he's a baby, but before he's baptized by John the Baptist, as we see Jesus as a young boy, and just the incredible prophetic things that happened in his life. We're going to study that uh, for the next several weeks after Thanksgiving, because hope is so key to navigate this life for Jesus Christ. You have to have hope for your future. You can't live in the past. You can't live with, oh, man, my mom, my dad, uh, my grandpa, my grandma, there's addiction, there's pain, there's all these things. No, we have to think bigger and better about what God wants to do in our lives. And I would say as a church, we're believing that God has given us a vision so big that we'll only be able to accomplish it with God's help. I, I, I hear that agreement in Jesus' name. I'm going I'm to preach out of this thought for just a moment, a vision for honor. A vision for honor. Now, Pastor Larry last week, he talked about the, the beautiful story and I love Pastor Larry because he's our in-house theologian, so he's much smarter than all of us biblically. So we just lean on him. And, and he unpacked the great story of Abraham being asked to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. Uh, make some noise if you were blessed by Pastor Larry's message last week. I love you, Pastor Larry. 
Before we get into the text, though, I want to honor someone. Uh, Gayton Lider is here, a missionary, uh, Assemblies of God, a, a nationally appointed missionary to Bulgaria. Where are you? We just want to honor you. Can you stand and can we just give some love to my friend Gayton? We love you. We're honored that you'd be with us today. Um, yeah, not many of us have been to Bulgaria. Not many of us will be called to a place like Bulgaria, but we're all called to leave a legacy of faith. Uh, so before Abraham and Sarah would be asked to sacrifice Isaac, their son on an altar, leading up to that, there's this really cool thing that happens, but it seemed very, very bleak at the time. And many of us in our, in our family story, we have these really bleak, bleak times, and if we continue to trust God, uh, we continue to honor God through it, God does something amazing. God does something impossible. And this happened in, Abra in Abraham's life. Next week, we're going to talk about Abram and Sarai being transformed to Abraham and Sarah. We're going to talk about that story next week. But this week, uh, we're talking about that time where there's still Abram and Sarai, and they've settled in the land of Canaan, but then there was war in the land, and there were four kings that ended up taking over the land that Lot had chosen for his family. Lot and Abram were uh, uncle and nephew in relationship. They split up, and because they were so wealthy, they took different areas of the country. So four kings and their armies come, and they conquer the area where Lot has settled. They don't just conquer it, they kill a bunch of people, and they capture Lot, his entire family, and all of his possessions. Now, Abram could have said, ooh, stinks to be you. You know, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, Abram trusted God and just settled wherever Lot didn't want to settle. And now Lot, who saw something good with his eyes, he settled in what looked to be a good land. Now he's the one that got captured by some kings. So Abram could have easily said, you know, Lot, man, that stinks, bro. Hope, you know, hope God comes through for you. But instead, no, Abram rounds up 318 people from his own family. And they go fight in a war against the kings that had taken his nephew and his nephew's entire family captive. He doesn't just take them captive. He doesn't just beat this, this, uh, this nation or these nations that had captured his nephew. But he, he rescues Lot and his family, brings them out of that. And now he's in this predicament. Because before, Abram could kind of be in the shadows of the world. But now Abram is essentially a nation himself. He has his own army, and now he's on the map, which is not a good thing to be on the map of battles and wars. And so Abram needs to start developing his own military, building up his own defenses, and really trying to protect himself because now he's made enemies because he rescued his nephew Lot and his family. Now, after God comes through in an amazing way, there will always be an opportunity for you and for me to honor God. And we're going to talk a little bit about what it looks like to honor God. And we're going to look to see what Abram and Sarai did. It says, Then Melchizedek, in Genesis 14, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram, it says, gave him a tenth of everything. And this is the first time in, scriptures, Genesis, in Scripture, Genesis 14, where we see a tithe occur. Now, many knowledgeable, wise people would have told Abram, Abram, you are silly. Do you realize that you've now won a war, but now you are on the map? You need to invest every last dollar developing your own military to protect yourself from the nations of the earth. And we read in Hebrews chapter 7 that Melchizedek was a type, a representation of Jesus Christ. And when Melchizedek came out, he basically relayed to Abram, Abram, isn't it so great that God has provided for you? God has done a great thing and delivered your enemies into your hand. Um, and he, he essentially causes a celebration to occur. Abram without being asked, just gives a tenth of everything he owns to Melchizedek, the high priest, knowing full well that he probably could have used that for himself to develop his own army, his own country, and his own defenses. And we start to see Abram's heart show 
because he's continuing to realize the only reason that I have success, the only reason that God has promoted me, protected me, and provided for me is because God has blessed my life. Um, Alyssa and I, uh, I shared a couple weeks ago, we've always tithed. And we were always educated in the tithe. I don't know how much of that really sunk in at the time. But uh, I will tell you that every time we've tithed ourselves, we just honor God. Like, God, we just want to honor you knowing that it all belongs to you. Uh, Every good thing that happens in our life is because you provided for it. And everything that we're going to go through in the future, we realize that you're going you're gonna to keep the good thing going. You're going to provide for needs even when it's hard, even when there's deep pain and sorrow in our lives. In Proverbs chapter 3, we read about trusting in the Lord and honoring the Lord. And we don't always read all of Proverbs 5. There's a very famous verse in Proverbs chapter 5. Uh, this might be a verse that some of us have even like put in a frame and it's on like a doorway or it's on a wall in our house. But in Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 10, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him. And how I learned it originally was acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Something that really stands out to me is, how do we honor the Lord? It says right here, to honor the Lord with our wealth, with the first fruits of what we have. And then God blesses the rest in a way that you and I can't quite explain. So I really believe Abram and Sarai were, were functioning We're living out Proverbs chapter 3 in its entirety and not just, you know, trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding. That resonates with me because I don't have enough understanding. But then he goes on so that you'll have good health. And I'm not here to tell you that when you give, you know, like like you all of a sudden don't get influenza. Like I'm not trying to tell you that. It's It's like you pay for the divine vaccination. I'm not into that. That's creepy. But have you ever felt like, and I'm speaking to you as someone who, you know, roofed houses for five summers, uh, I was a frontline pharmacist, I was a pharmacy manager, I was a director of pharmacy. You ever felt sometimes that you're like working yourself to death? Um, you ever felt that you're at least working yourself to exhaustion? You ever felt like, I, I believe there's some people in this room, um, you've actually gone home from work and you're like, man, I'd rather die than face what I have to face at work tomorrow. And uh, it gets serious when Your workplace has people that are not nice, or customers or clients that aren't nice, or patients that aren't nice. Sometimes you have family members that have even encouraged you to quit your job because they see what it's doing to you. I know that there are marriages represented in this place. Your husband, I was somebody from like five or six years ago, I I didn't even know we were friends anymore. He texts me this week, this week. Hey, Dave, I know you left pharmacy, but can I get some career advice from you? And I texted, like, do you know I became a pastor? I know nothing about pharmacy anymore. He's like, that's okay. So, so we talk. He's moved to Michigan now, but he said, he said Dave, I, I just knew you'd listen. I'm between these two jobs right now. One pays a lot more money, but I am miserable in that job. I'm thinking about moving to a different job where I can actually breathe. And he's like, Dave, would you just, like, help me understand what I should do? And I was like, well, you kind of answered the question didn't you? And I'm not saying all of us should go home and quit our jobs, but I am saying this is a real wrestling point, isn't it? And when Proverbs says, so that it will bring health to your body and your bones, I'll tell you that every time Alyssa and I have given out of our income, this is what we say to God, God, I don't want to work myself to death. That meeting tomorrow, I need your wisdom to know what to say. Um, That shift I have tonight, I know that it's going to go the way you want it to go because I'm trusting you. I'm not trusting in myself. And I just believe that uh, you and I need to experience what Abram experienced. So we're going to go back to Genesis, but it's chapter 15, because after Abram gives a tenth back, God speaks to Abram in a vision. Say vision. In a vision. We're talking about vision, and here God is speaking to Abram in a vision. Listen to what God says to Abram after Abram gives a tenth of everything he has to Melchizedek. After this, it says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, 
I am your shield, your very great reward. Did you know that that was prophetic because out of Abram's line would come Jesus Christ? And as we are generous, we realize that we don't live for an earthly reward, we live for a heavenly reward. Only when you see Jesus Christ face to face at the end of your life do you realize this was the reward. Of all of the toil, of all of the heartache, of all the struggle, I just want to give you hope. Your life might be terrible right now, but when you see Jesus face to face, everything will be washed away and it will just be you and him. And you'll realize that, God, it was you protecting me. It was you providing for me. It was you helping me not to fear tomorrow or the next shift or the next weekend in your rotation. But God, you are my shield. I don't need to fear. You are my great reward. Doesn't that feel a lot better than hoarding everything and clutching on so dearly to the things in our life? Sounds pretty amazing. But then we get to Jesus, right? And there was this woman in the Bible who understood this great reward of Jesus. Because it was all about Jesus. It was always about him. Everything in the Old Testament pre-Jesus is all pointing to Jesus. Sorry, my camera friends. I'm like moving around. Don't move around. It was always about pointing to him. And in this church, we always point to Jesus. We, we don't want you to fall in love with this church. We don't want you to fall in love with me. We don't want you to fall in love with Alyssa, although that's easy to do. We want you to fall in love with Jesus Christ. Man, it doesn't matter if the preaching's good if you love Jesus. It, it doesn't matter if there was a dirty coffee cup in your pew if Jesus is here, right? You might be like, man, the coffee was a little cool. Yeah, but Jesus is always red hot in your life, you know, ready to do something great. And this woman knew this, right? So there's this woman. All we know about her is that she had a rough life, like a really rough life. Um, and she comes in, and Jesus and his disciples, they're all hanging out with Jesus. And I'm sure as a disciple, they're like, man, we the disciples, man. Everybody wishes they could be us, but they're not us. We're us. Anybody you ever felt like you're on the outside of a sacred society? I have. I'm like, man, those other people, they're really righteous and holy. And I still deal with stuff. This woman, I think, really felt like that. So all she knows what to do is to come in. She brings what would have been a year's wages worth of perfume. She comes in. She breaks the jar. And she just pours it over Jesus' head and his feet. This is one of only a few things in Scripture that comes up in each of the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means several perspectives but through one eye. So we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels. This story appears in all three Gospels. Other things that occur in all three Gospels, the birth of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and a few other really key things. But this woman's generosity is celebrated in each of the Synoptic Gospels, probably because of how the disciples were really moved. So she breaks it and pours it over his head, and the disciples, man, they're the disciples. I mean, let's go, you know? Like, we're going places with him. They're not encouraged. They're not challenged. They're not inspired by this woman. They are annoyed. It, the Bible uses the word indignant. That's a big vocab word that some of us learned in seventh grade. And if you loved like vocab in seventh grade, you learned words like chagrin. The Bible uses this word indignant. Literally that word means they were annoyed. They were annoyed by this woman. And Jesus speaks up for her. And in Matthew chapter 26... Verses 10 through 13, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And don't you want to live your life doing beautiful things unto Jesus? What if your life and my life, you saw Jesus face to face and Jesus said, you just did a beautiful thing for me while you were on the earth. Jesus said, if you love the least of these, you've loved me. Verse 11, he says, the poor you will always have with you but you'll not always have me. The disciples, I think with good intentions, said we could have sold that and think of all the people we could have helped. And Jesus is correcting their thinking, you know. Yes, you have to take care of people. I'm not talking about that, but this woman, her heart was for me. Verse 12, when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. 
Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And here we are, so many years later, celebrating the generosity of this woman's heart, honoring, a vision for honor. This woman woke up that morning and said, I have a vision to honor the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What do I have? A lot of perfume. How much does it cost? A lot of money. What should I do with it? Pour it over Jesus' head. Here's a key truth that's not in my notes. Generosity will rarely make sense. And, And here's what I'll propose to you. In my life and in Alyssa's life, in our journey of generosity, generosity is a growing process. Um, we've had to do small things before we do big things. Some of us, we think we can't be generous because we can't give a car away, you know. But what about small things that you can do to invest in the lives of the people around you? When you are generous towards somebody, you just kill the enemy. Because the enemy is all about us keeping and hoarding and for other people not to be blessed. Jesus is all about, hey, do things that are a little off the beaten path, because let me tell you, all of these disciples in the room that day, they're probably like jaw drop. They walked away never the same, and we know that because all of the Gospels speak about this woman's sacrifice. But I want to just clarify one thing. We have one vision at Northview Church, and this is our first point. The vision is not about Jesus. The vision doesn't serve what Jesus would want us to do. The vision doesn't have Jesus as a recipient of the vision. Um, We don't even like do the vision and at the end say, Jesus, we don't do that either. This is the key point. The vision is Jesus. It is him. It is him on the earth. The vision is that he would be known. This is what we read in scripture. It all comes from him. It's all through him and it's all unto him. The vision is Jesus. And did you know that in your life and in my life, there is sufficiency in him. That's another big vocab word from seventh grade. There's sufficiency. All of your effort and my effort, all of your effort and my effort, will never make up for the sufficiency that you can only find in Jesus. This is what generosity does. It exposes none of us have enough. None of us can fill the void that Jesus can fill. So we just use generosity to open up as many doors as possible so that people can receive the free gift of forgiveness that Jesus offers. Make no mistake, this church is a Jesus church. This church will always serve Jesus first and foremost. There will only be one king, there will only be one person we're trying to serve, and that is Jesus Christ. The only person's presence we ever care about, even though you have Alyssa up here, you have Pastor Larry. Pastor Larry, we only care about Jesus being up here, right? We don't care about ourselves. We hope that years from now, people are like, yeah, there was this pastor. He was a pharmacist, which I think is like legalized drug dealing. Anyway, he did something later. 20 years, you know, he was gone. We kicked him out because he was old. But there was Jesus there. And I heard his voice. And I felt his presence. And when we prayed, he spoke to me. And by the way, can I just be, can I just, can I just preach for just a second? Just a moment. This has nothing to do with my message. But did you know that you and I can pray for people? Did you know that? Like, when did we, like, think only pastors prayed for people? When did we think only spiritual anointed people pray? Did you know that God loves it when you pray? And I'm not talking about, you know, before bed at night, Lord help me, good night. I'm talking about what would happen if when you woke up with your roommates, with your friends, with your husband or wife, that you said, let's link, let's link hands. I'm not a theologian but prayer is just talking to God, so let's pray. Alyssa and I did this this morning, and she's our kid's pastor, and she's going for it, so we joined hands, and I said, Jesus, help us today. Give us strength. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Do things we can't do. Speak things we can't speak. Amen. Now, how many of you would raise your hand and say, not super theologically deep? Just be it. it. not, not, Not too bad. You can do it. In the drug world, you say, you can do it. Nicorette can help. (laughs) You can do it. The Holy Spirit can help. And I'm not trying to draw a parallel between Nicorette and the Holy Spirit. But just open up your mouth and pour your heart out. You got a friend at work who's struggling. Hey, can we pray quickly and quietly about that? Someone bows their heads close. Dear Jesus, help my friend. Amen. You know, you might even like 
botched the prayer. You might have stumbled over the prayer. You might have stuttered. But you know what? Jesus does not need your perfect language to move in somebody's life. And this might be in the nurse's station. This might be at the gas station. But you just, you just say, can I pray with you quickly and quietly? I have another point. I got to get through my points. Here's another point. Um, when you honor God, you turn pressure into peace. Did you know that when you get paid for your job, which you work really hard at, when you, when you receive it into your bank account, man, and you keep it all, you're like, good job me, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm good at what I do. I work hard. Did you know that that's great, but then the pressure's on you to keep it going? Like, man, how am I gonna keep this good thing going at work? When, when you give, where there's pressure, you can turn it into peace because you're like, you know, God, um, <laughs> this is what's really cool. I'm giving back to you what's rightfully yours, knowing that it all belongs to you, and I don't have to live with pressure because I didn't make this happen, so I don't have to keep it going. You're the one that keeps it going. It's the power of Jesus that keeps the good things going in your life. And every time you give back to God what's rightfully his, all you're saying is, God, <laughs> I'd like to hold the pressure on my own shoulders, but I'm not. It's up to you because you have really, really big shoulders. And we read in Proverbs 3, like there's health in your own bones. This working to death cycle can be broken when you're just like, you know what, God, it was never about me keeping up at work. It was about you helping me do what I need to do to honor you in my workplace. Um, it's, it's cool because the IRS doesn't trust you, you know. The IRS doesn't care about you loving them. They just say, this is your tax bracket, now pay or we send the cops. There is no love, and I, I'm a big believer. If we're gonna honor God, we have to pay our taxes. Uh, amen, I mean, like, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God. Because there's, uh, the IRS is like, we don't care. We're coming after you. They're thankful for the church because we say honor the government, honor our leaders, right? That's, at Northview Church, we honor our leaders. Uh, but the IRS uh, doesn't care whether you love them or not. They just say, this is ours. This is what I love about God. Um, God is a love-based God. When Jesus comes and dies for you, Jesus doesn't say, and in exchange, you give me 10% of what you make. No. There's no love without a choice. To express love, there has to be an expression of choice. Jesus, he said it himself, I lay my life down with my own accord. Um, so when Alyssa and I give, uh, we, we don't give under compulsion. We're like, you loved us, out of the love that you've given us that outflows out of us, we love you. And when you can truly love Jesus because you want to, there's really nothing that frees you and I more than that. And it will impact your family. And here's what's really cool. It gives you a vision for your legacy of faith in your life. And your, your kids will talk about it. Your grandkids will talk about it. Um, but I want to share one other thing with you. And Alyssa did not talk about this last week, but I wanted her to. Uh, when we first moved to Rochester, there was a family in our church. And they were driving to Mayo. Um, they lived out of town. They were driving into Mayo Clinic for treatment. And uh, Alyssa and I, we were newly married, tons of student loan debt. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, but there was this family that they were driving into Mayo. They were having friends give them a ride because they had no car. And um, like, um, sometimes you just need people to encourage you in your life. And um, we prayed for them, we talked to them. But I remember when I came home one day, Alyssa said, I think we should give this family our car. And I was like, you crazy. <laughs> She's like, no, we, we live close to the hospital, we can walk to work. So she already had this planned out. So I said, okay. Um, so I remember being in the parking lot of our apartment building and we signed over the vehicle to them. And, you think, oh man, the next day, like God like dropped like a Yukon in our parking lot. That didn't happen. For the next seven years, Alyssa drove a beater vehicle. One door wouldn't open. Um, it had three leaks, actually it had two leaks, and at the third leak, we finally gave up on it. Alyssa drove a beater car for the next seven years. The car she gave away, we gave away, it was really her, was way nicer than what she drove the next seven years. And, um, just last year, that family called us and they said, we remembered what you did uh, because 
we were going through a really difficult time taking our son for treatment every week. And he, uh, we ended up having a great outcome, but we just felt we needed to reach out to you because we'll never forget the generosity of your family. Um, now, Alyssa has a really nice car now, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like God, you know, dropped a, an amazing car the next day. It wasn't about being blessed. Um, it was just about being obedient. And uh, what I love about Alyssa's heart is it wasn't even a question for her. I'm not saying you have to give away a car, but for us it was transformative uh, because we, we fully realized we weren't being a blessing to get blessing. We were just wanting to meet a need. And let's have our eyes open this week, friends. Uh, whatever need is around us, let's meet that need, amen? Can we stand in this place as we close? Um, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask, maybe, maybe you don't know Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior, but you want to. Uh, maybe you've had a relationship with the Lord in the past and you've let it grow cold. I don't know what your situation is. But God was so generous that he gave his only son as a sacrifice for you and me. And I'm going to pray a prayer in just a few moments, and I want to include people in that prayer who want to say yes to Jesus, who want to dedicate their lives to Jesus Christ to live for him, to follow him, to be forgiven by him, to have new life through the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus. If you're in this place and you wanna be included in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today, will you just raise your hand? Just like, I'm, I'm unapologetic. Pastor Dave, I need that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. I'm gonna pray, we're all gonna pray out loud, but pray this with me, dear Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice and for your generosity in my life. But I also thank you that you rose and that through that, you forgive me. You wash me clean. You give me a new start. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. May I never be the same. Thank you for new life. Here's my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we just rejoice with the people who made that decision today? We're excited for you. As we go into this last worship song, let's continue to ask the Lord, God, help us to honor you through generosity. Can we open up our hands to the Lord as if to receive today? Father, we just ask that whatever you want us to do, we open up our hands. We live with an open hand. You've been so generous to us, it's our privilege to give back to you, to live open-handed in our lives and to trust your Holy Spirit to do the things we cannot do in Jesus' name.